Well, I got good news and I got bad news. Which would you like to hear first? See, this is, I knew that was going to be the answer, right? <laughs> this idea of news, whether it be good or bad, everybody wants to hear the bad news first because they want to end with the good news, right? And so to that end, you know, I, I went just a few minutes ago. I, I know it's, it's, please forgive me, but while y'all were singing so beautifully, I, I looked online just real quick. What are the headlines? What is the news of the day? What's the news of the day? It's not good news. It's never good news. There's, there was a shooting in Georgia, and they're still going on. The, just the stuff that's associated with, well, yeah, this person, the suspect, this mother, called the school and said something bad's going to happen. Uh, my wife told me this morning on the way here that there's a recall of over one and a half million trucks. I'm like... Well, that's not good news either. Uh, Florida won last night. That's good news. <laughs> I needed some of that good news because it's not been a good season. It's not been a good three or four seasons, actually. But beside the point, there is so much bad news out there. I mean, right, Florida State? Bad news. I mean, come on. I mean, and here's the deal. It depends on your perspective, right? Perspective makes a difference because I, I went to the University of Florida. I, I'm a fan. And so seeing Florida State being 0-2, <laughs> you know, that's good news. But I do understand because half my family, I mean, our family, you know, growing up in Live Oak, Half my town went to Florida, half the town went to Florida State. And so, it, you know, it, it's, it's hard because you've got so many people who love that place and so many people who don't love that place. And so what's good news to one may be bad news to another person. And so uh, this idea of news permeates everything. In fact, there was a time when the news was an important part of our culture, right? And I didn't know this until I was doing a little bit of research. But do you know why we have an hour, or, or used to, have an hour between roughly 6 and 7 every night dedicated to the news? Well, actually, there was a law that was mandated, free of charge, that the people of America would receive free news about what was going on in the nation they forgot to add in the part that there would be no ads associated with it because well but slowly but surely whoever gave them the most money was able to slant the news and so over time we, we got this idea that news is important being informed is important we need to know what's going on we need to i i, I wouldn't begrudge anyone for being well informed about what's going on in the nation in the state, in their counties, in their families. News. News is important. But slowly but surely, we figured out that whoever controls the news can control the people. And, and so we have even other nations trying to influence our news, right? Why? So they can slant it in such a way to make who they want get elected in such a way that the people are ignorant about what's really going on. And so today, we've gotten to the point where everything I read in the news, I don't know if I can trust it or not. I, I, just, I just don't. Because what has happened is, we again, we divided in half. You're either for this person or you're against this person or this party or that party. And so you've got people on this side and their news agencies who slant things way this way. And then you've got other people in response have now started slanting everything to that way and say, who can you trust? There is no more Walter Cronkite where you could turn him on and it's like, whatever you heard from him, you knew it was truth, right? It, it was true. It was news. Whether good or bad, you knew what you were listening to was truth. Even slowly after that, Dan Rather. But then slowly but surely, 
with the plethora of cable news and then now internet news and with social media. In fact, most people, and this was five years ago when it was still Twitter, most people got their news from social media, Twitter, than they did uh, the normal news outlets such as newspapers and the evening news, right? And so the idea that news is important ha is important. In fact, it's been that way forever, right? Why do you think we have the books that we have? Why do you think we have the history books that we have? Because it's actually news, right? The, the things that they put down were important enough to them in those days that they wanted to make sure that the people going forward knew what had happened because it was important. It was important news. Uh, and so today we're going to take a look at what we consider the most important news of all. We call it the good news or we call it the gospel, right? The gospel. And so we're, we're, Esther's gone. I mean, she's still here, but hopefully she lives on in our hearts. You've, we've learned lots of great things from Esther, but it's time to move on from her and it's time to, to move on to the next few weeks. We're just going to talk about this idea of the gospel, okay? And so let's open our Bibles and go to Mark chapter 1. So what is the gospel? gospel. Well, hopefully, over the next three to four to five weeks, we're going to figure out what the gospel is. What is this good news? And I chose Mark to, to start us off with, because that's how he begins his gospel. In fact, we have four books of the Bible that's called the gospel. And so, it can get quite confusing. Is gospel a book? Is it four books? Is it the news about Jesus? I mean, what is it exactly? So hopefully by the time we're done over these next few weeks, we'll have a good grasp on this term, the gospel. So in Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 1, this is probably the earliest gospel written. And it says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it, is, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness, and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice from heaven you are my beloved son with you i am well pleased the spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him now after john was arrested jesus came into galilee proclaiming the gospel of god saying the time is fulfilled kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Father, we, uh, we ask for great wisdom this morning. We need your wisdom like we need this rain. We thank you for the rain and now we ask that your spirit-like rain would just fall down on this place. That we would be filled with your spirit in such a way that your discernment and wisdom would fill us, that we could see by reading your word what you have spoken to us in your word and through your spirit, what it means to have the good news, to believe the good news. So, Father, we, we want our hearts and minds open to what you would have to say to us today. Father, lead and guide and direct us because... Without you, without your spirit moving us, helping us, 
we know that we can do nothing. And so, Father, we place ourselves in your hands, and we pray all of these things in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our King. Amen. In the beginning was the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you got the gospel of Jesus Christ in verse 1. You go down to verse 14, you have uh, the gospel of God. And then we're told to believe in the gospel. So we all know what gospel means, right? It means good news. Gospel is good news. So you got the good news of Jesus, you got the good news of God, and you got the good news. Well, if you're reading Matthew, ten times he talks about the gospel of the kingdom. So you got the gospel of the kingdom. Are they all the same thing? Because if I were to ask us all today, what is the gospel? Can you share the gospel? How many of you would start with, well, let me tell you, we are all in need of a Savior because all have sinned and fallen short to the glory of God. But, but the wages of sin is death, right? Right? The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord, right? Right? Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from dead, you'll be saved. For with the mouth one confesses and is saved, and with the heart one believes and is justified, right? You've all heard. And so it's about the atoning death of Jesus Christ, all right? That's when we think of the gospel, we need to save people from hell, all right? That, that's what is in our collective consciousness, because when I say share the gospel, that's usually what we go for, right? And we've had these great classes, I mean great classes on share Jesus without fear, right? So how do we do that? Well, you sit down beside somebody and say, hey, do you have any spiritual thoughts? Or do you know if, if you were to pass away today, do you know where you would go? Or, or what would your eternal fate be? And all of these different ways to start a conversation with somebody to find out where they stand eternally. So we've made it about his death, right? You know, what he did, his atoning death. And don't get me wrong, that's, that's huge. So how can Jesus preach the gospel? He ain't dead yet. In fact, he preached the kingdom all the time. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. Over and over and over and over, and he wasn't dead. So how can Jesus preach his death, burial, and resurrection when he's not telling everybody about his death, burial, and resurrection? What, what is the gospel? Because nowhere in Scripture does it tell us what the gospel is, or, or maybe it does, and maybe we just haven't been paying attention, right? Maybe we haven't looked close enough because there are a couple places where it kind of does tell us what the gospel is and so let's see what Paul has to say yeah I know today we're going to be all over the place because this is more of a topical we're moving away from our book days so we're going to be a little bit more topical today so we're going to go to Romans right let's go to Romans chapter 1 Romans chapter 1 let's go to the great theologian Paul who, if anyone know what the gospel is, it would be Paul, right? Paul's a smart man. Paul knew, Paul knew Jesus. He knew his scriptures, right? He knew which at the time was the Old Testament. So, so if you go to the very first couple of verses of Romans, we get a definition of the gospel or what it's about. So he says, Paul, right? Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So here's Paul saying, here I am. I am set apart for the gospel of God, for the good news of God. Okay, now let me tell you about this good news of God, which he promised beforehand, which God promised beforehand, God promised this gospel, through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, okay, concerning his son. Okay, so the gospel, the good news is about Jesus, okay? Concerning his son, who was descended from David. Ah, 
So it's important. Paul needs us to know that the gospel is about Jesus, who is a descendant of David. According to the flesh, oh, a descendant of David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, Paul seems to think that the gospel concerns this person, Jesus Christ, who is, well, just by his name. What does he call him? Christ Jesus. His name isn't Christ. It's a title, right? We, we know that. But somehow, because we have it so read to us so much, we read it so much, sometimes we forget what exactly that means. So the word Christ is the same word in Greek as the word Messiah is in Hebrew. Same exact word. The anointed one. So every time that you see Jesus Christ in Scripture, and let me just tell you, it's all over the place. In fact, remember when Jesus was hanging out with his disciples and, and everybody was saying, you know, well, this is this guy, and it's this guy. And Jesus says, well, who do you think I am, Peter? What does Peter say? You're the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Holy One of God. See, that's the good news. That is the good news. That The good news is that the Messiah has arrived. I wish it were that simple, though. Because if you keep reading Paul, but you're going to have to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for this one. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is a famous passage about what the gospel is, and this is going to be more like what you're used to hearing. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we get this other idea, this other maybe definition of what the good news is. Because in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, if you know anything about this chapter, this is the resurrection chapter. You want to know anything about the resurrection well, wait a second, y'all just went through 1 Corinthians not too long ago, so you should have this memorized, right? This is memorized. You can just burn into your brains here. But as a reminder, just as a reminder, we're going to go back and just read these first few verses of chapter 15. Now, I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. So Paul's been preaching the gospel to them. I'm going to remind you again what it is, which you received and in which you stand, by which you are saved, so you're saved by this gospel. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and was raised on the third day, in accordance to the scriptures. So, that is another definition of the gospel. Right? The good news is that Christ he doesn't say Jesus, does he? He says the Messiah. He says the Messiah died according to the scriptures and he was buried and that he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. So Paul has in his mind, and this is why we do theology, right? Because theology is, is this idea is that we have to read and study and then start putting things together like a puzzle. Because that's what this is, right? Uh, this is why we have so many different books. This is why we have four Gospels. This is why we have so many letters to Paul. This is why we have letters from Peter. We have letters from Luke. We have all these different people coming together, giving us the Word of God, because through all of these different portraits, we get an idea of the one true God. And then we start adding in the Old Testament, because the Old Testament is important. Because... Paul and Peter and James and John and Luke could have written none of this without the word from the Old Testament because that's all they had. So for them, the good news had nothing to do with this person named Jesus who came and died on a cross because they had no idea that was going to happen. But post-Jesus, we see Paul now saying, 
The gospel is about a Messiah, the son of David. Why is that important? Because a promise that was made in 2 Samuel to David. It's called the Davidic covenant, right? The Davidic covenant says, David, I know you want to build a house for me. Thank you, but you're not going to do it. That's going to be your son. But here's what I'm going to do for you, David. Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build you an eternal house. I'm going to build you a house that will never be empty. I'm going to build you a house that says, I will never leave or forsake you because from you there will always be someone to sit on my throne. Always. And one day, someone will. Eternally. And so you see Paul saying, this guy, this Christ, he's from David. He's the one. He's the one you've been looking for. Because that's what they've been waiting for. The good news to every Jew was not, oh, someone's going to die for our sins. How great. It was not what they were looking for. That was not the gospel to them. Their gospel, well, Mark mentions it. Let's go back to Mark chapter 1 again. Mark starts his gospel off. Let me tell you, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, who, by the way, is the Son of God. And one day, if we ever get around to it, we've got to talk about the names of God because the Son of God is not a title of deity throughout most of Scripture. The Son of God actually is a a human title who's been given authority to rule. So anytime, for the most part, you see son of God, not sons of God, but son of God. It's a title to, de- uh, not deity, but a title to kingship. So what you see is Mark getting up and going, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, son of God, which for a Jew, if you were the son of God like David, son of God. David was the son of God. He was the king. Solomon, son of God. The kings of Israel were called a son of God. Why? Because they were the king foreshadowing Jesus. And so, you've got this Messiah, this king. He was foretold in Isaiah. How many of you got little, at the bottom, you got little numbers beside these verses up here, and then down here you got little references to what they go to? I I recommend you get them, because there's just like little negative. This is good stuff because he's quoting the Old Testament. He says he's quoting Isaiah. He doesn't. Not at least in the beginning. You know, he he quotes somebody else. He doesn't quote Isaiah. And behold, I send a messenger before your face who will prepare the way. Let's see. That has a verse 3, and it's got a little C up there. Verse 2, and it's got a little C. So if I come way down here... And get my eyes focused just correctly. I see that's a quote from Malachi 3. If I were to look at Malachi 3, I'm going to find those words. Mark kind of mashes things together. Because, you know, Mark's inspired by the Spirit. So guess what? He can do these things. He can't. I don't recommend you go around saying, this is what Isaiah says and quote a completely different book. Don't do that. Okay? But Mark does. Then he says, the one crying in the wilderness. We're back to Isaiah chapter 40. The one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Or prepare the way of Yahweh. Make his paths straight. What Mark just did was tie what Isaiah was saying to this dude named Jesus. You want to know who Jesus is? This Messiah Jesus, the son of God who is the king? Well, he's the one that Isaiah talked about when he says, I'm sending someone to prepare his way. And the very next words are John the Baptist, the one who prepared the way. That means the person coming after John the Baptist is the king, is the one. Because see, even the Old Testament had good news. It wasn't called, in Greek it's called euangelion, right? The good news. In Hebrew it's called basar, good news. And good news was important in the Old Testament because usually good news was when a king had won a battle and good news was sent by a messenger back to the people proclaiming the good news that the battle had won. Good news was sent back to David 
that Absalom was dead because Yahweh had delivered David from the clutches of his enemy. This is all good news. This is bizarre. This is something that God did on behalf of his people. Isaiah 40 through the rest of the book are what's called the servant passages. This, this glimpse into this future servant. Sometimes it's Israel, the people of Israel, and sometimes it's this Messiah person. And all of Isaiah, these last few chapters, points to good news of someone who's coming. Because here's what the people of Israel are waiting for. The quick review, all right, of Israel's history. And the reason I know this is when you read the book of Acts, read the book of Acts, and you read all those sermons that Peter taught, and even Paul, most of them did not talk about you're going to die and go to hell if you don't have Jesus because he died for your sins on the cross. And if you believe in him, you too will be saved. No. What did they preach? They preached back in the day, God created everything. And we rebelled against him. And so God raised up a man, Abraham, and created this nation, Israel, of whom we are part of. And our job is to proclaim the king of the universe, God, to the peoples of this world because we are blessed by God and we are supposed to take that blessing and bless all the nations of the world with it. We have failed in that blessing. We have failed in our job and we have been taken into captivity. We need saving from ourselves. We need saving because we have rebelled against the one true God because and that one true God was faithful to his word. We broke his covenant. And he said when we do that, he would send us to the nations. We talked a little bit about it last week, how God hides his face. He has been hiding his face from them. They're waiting for the day when the Messiah will come and lead them back into the land and rule over them in a kingdom of peace and prosperity like it was intended to be from the beginning. That's the good news. The good news isn't about us. See, what we've done is we've turned the gospel into what's going to happen to me if I, when I die. I need Jesus, so in order for me to be okay, then I need to accept Jesus. And that's not wrong. But that puts the emphasis on the wrong thing. See, the emphasis is, the good news is Jesus. It's, it's two things. It's who he is and what he's done. You want to spend eternity with Jesus? Know who he is and what he's done. You see it in Paul. Who he is. He is the Messiah, according to the flesh. Son of David, according to the flesh. King. He died for our sins, according to the scripture, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scripture. It's this idea that you have a Messiah who's different than anything else you ever thought. You see, the good news for the Jews was Isaiah 40 through 42, or 52. Because in 52, I'm going to read it real quick for you. It's quoted in Romans chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 15. How are they to preach unless they are sent? And as is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Right? That's from Isaiah chapter 52. The good news is the Messiah is coming back. The Messiah is coming and he's going to lead us out of bondage, out of captivity. We're going to go back to the land and we're going to live in peace and harmony because that's who our king is. He will enforce his righteous rule over us, which is actually for the best. That's what they were waiting for. But the very next chapter in Isaiah is Isaiah 53. And if you know anything about Isaiah 53... It's about this suffering servant. So you've got this idea that the Messiah is coming, he's going to be king, and then all of a sudden Isaiah talks about the servant who is beaten and bloodied and battered. Wait, that has, wait, what, what has that got to do with this king who is coming? And they didn't really understand it all. See, we do. See, they didn't understand the extent of their sin and their rebellion. See, do you know what it takes to be saved in the Old Testament? If you were living before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know what it meant to be saved? How were you were saved? 
exactly the same thing after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is why Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 is so important. By grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, right? Which God prepared beforehand that no one, that, that we would walk in them. See, you were saved by grace after Christ. You were saved by grace before Christ. You're saved by grace. You didn't, they didn't do anything in the Old Testament to merit their salvation, just like I haven't done anything today to merit my salvation. Nothing whatsoever, because I'm not that good. What did they do in the Old Testament? They just believed that God was who he said he was and did what he said he was going to do. Wait a second. What does it mean for us to be saved today, that we believe that Jesus is who he says he is and did what he said he did. It's exactly the same thing. We know the object of our faith. They saw in the future that the object of their faith was coming. And all they had to do was believe that the king was coming. The king was coming. See, somehow, and there was a big debate in the late 70s about lordship salvation. Well, I don't need to make him Lord. All I have to do is believe that he loves me and died for me. No. It's not lordship salvation. You can't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other. He's not called Jesus Christ for nothing. He's Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the King. Messiah (coughs) means anointed. You know who was anointed in the Old Testament, right? Kings. Kings were anointed. Kings and high priests, the only two people who were always anointed. Sometimes prophets were anointed. But always the king was anointed. Always the high priest. And guess who is the great high priest? Jesus. And who is the king? Jesus. He fulfills both of those roles. He takes the roles that were separated and brings them back together in one person. Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah. In fact... Pay attention to Paul. When he talks about Jesus, he doesn't use Jesus. He'll either say Jesus the Christ, Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ our Lord this. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a second. In no way, shape, or form does Paul ever separate this dude walking around in Jerusalem who died saying, yep, all you got to do is believe this. Some dude died. He died for your sins. When he did it, he took away your sins. No, you follow that guy because that guy is your king. That guy is your king who's going to take you out of the kingdom of darkness and bring you into a kingdom of marvelous light. All right, read Colossians what? Is it 1.13? Colossians 1.13. It's not about, oh, I get to go to heaven when I die. No, it's about a transfer of kingdoms. It's about who you belong to. It's about who you follow. Colossians 1.13, Jesus, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness, from the domain, from the area that's controlled by darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. It's about a transfer of kingdom. Kingdom, right, two words, king and domain a king's domain a kingdom is a king's domain you want to be in a kingdom you got to have a minimum of two things a king and a place where he rules right the israelites spent years in a kingdom that did not belong to them that god had given over to the nations waiting for the one who would bring them back into the kingdom And if they believe that God will be sending that person soon and follow him and follow the rules that he laid out for them, then they would be eternally with Yahweh. For us today, it's not a simple ascent. Yeah, this guy, Jesus, he died because even the demons know Jesus. The question is, who do you follow? Who's your king? Who is your Lord? Who is your Messiah? Because, see, the gospel isn't simply about, yep, someone died for me. No, your king died for you. And he was resurrected. In fact, when Paul is preaching to Acts in Acts 17 
to the Athenians, right? This is a perfect example of an evangelistic message to people who don't know all the history of the Old Testament, right? Which is a lot like us today. Does he talk about all that stuff? No, he talks about a creator. If you read Acts 17 and you read the sermon, if you read the sermon, it's not about the Jews. It's about a creator. It's about a God who created everything and rules over everything. And it was proved that he was put on this earth and given the rule by his death, burial, and resurrection. He was, it didn't talk about his atoning death. He said nothing about, you know what, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, you'll be saved and you'll all be with him forever. No, you believe that this person, Jesus Christ, is king of the universe. And here's how we know it. He died and God raised him from the dead. That's the good news. You have a king who loved you so much that wants you in his kingdom so badly that he died for you. Because, see, the kingdom isn't in heaven. I mean, that's probably a temporary holding place until he moves the kingdom to here on earth because we are designed for the earth. He's going to be king sitting on the throne of David on this earth. And everything we do here on this earth is just practice for them. Everything we do is practice for them because the rules, the regulations, all those things that he gave us, this moral code, isn't you do this and you'll be saved. No, you do this because this is what it looks like in my kingdom. Because in my kingdom, you do go to bed at night without locking your doors. In my kingdom, you can go do whatever you're going to do and no one's going to laugh at you, talk about you, gossip about you. No one's going to hurt you. So basically... It's paradise because you have a king who's going to enforce the rules. You have a king who is bringing a kingdom of righteousness, a kingdom of light. That's why, again, the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. That's, see, we're praying down heaven because the good news is that we have a king who loves us so much and wants to give us a kingdom Right? Because in Peter, he talks about moving us from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of his marvelous light. He wants to make us a holy nation, a kingdom. That's the good news. The good news is, oh, I get to, I'm okay. No. The good news is that I've got a king who loves me and wants to bring me into his kingdom. We've got to stop making it about us and making it about him. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about him. We're going to go through the Gospels. We're going to go through and talk about what it means to read and how to read the Gospels. Because we were given four books by four different authors to give us four different perspectives called the good news about Jesus Christ. Four. He gave us four. Simply, all it did was talk about Jesus. Right? I mean, think about it. Mark, the shortest one of all, you do realize most of that book is about the last couple of weeks of his life. I mean, it speeds right through his whole life. It doesn't even talk about his birth. Who cares about his birth? Well, let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to the good stuff. Here's our king. And everything he did shows that he's our king. We have a king. He loves us. The good news is that the king has come. The king has come, and he's sitting at the right hand of God, ruling from heaven. That's the good news. And in order to do that, he had to die. He had to die. And so part of what we're going to do this next few weeks is we're going to learn how to share the gospel. There's nothing wrong with sharing the gospel the way we've been doing it. We do realize that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But you know what? Most of them don't even know what God is. No, most of them today don't even know what sin is. They don't. What's sin? What do you mean I've offended a God? No, what they need to realize is that there's something bigger than they are in this world, and that person, that thing is God, and that God sent his son. And his son, his son is the king. He's the one that we've been waiting for. 
because we're all, see, that's what we, that's what the gospel is about. It's like something deep down inside all of us is longing for something bigger and better because I'm tired of bad news. I am tired of bad news. I'm tired of every day. I've stopped reading the news. I mean, I don't have to read the news to hear about it because it's everywhere. I want some good news. I want to see where people have saved other people's lives selflessly, who have given their bank account to someone who, in, who was in greater need than they were. See, that's what the kingdom of God, that's good news. And they did it because Jesus is their king, because that's what Jesus would have them do. And so as we go through these next few weeks, we're going to talk about Jesus. It's going to be great because there's nothing better to talk about than Jesus, right? And so we're going to figuratively take him apart, you know, put him back together because that's what he wants us to do. He's given us all this scripture in here. He's given us these descriptions of who he is. And you can't escape the one thing that is true about him. He is not Jesus. He is Jesus the Christ. He is Jesus the Christ, our Lord. And so, as we move through here, hopefully our appreciation and our love and our devotion to our King would grow. We've taken oaths to our Constitution if you're in office or in the military. We pledge allegiance to the flag. These are all important things. We vote. We, we do all these things to show allegiance. What do we do? What do we do to show allegiance to the true king? What are the outward signs that people know that we are a follower of the king? Because, see, people know, especially on the holidays, that we're patriotic Americans. What do people know about us when it comes to the king that we say we serve? Yes, but what does that look like? What does our lives say about ourselves? Because we go out of our way to make sure. We, we have bumper stickers, you know, right, to say this is who we are, you know. We put little apples or, you know, our favorite college and all of these things. Sometimes you see a fish, but some, you know, it's scary. I'm telling you, you put that fish back there, people will know that you're a Christian then. And then when you, you know, get angry when you're driving down the road, see, that's a Christian, right? See, everyone, you'll laugh because you know what I'm talking about. We have a king. That's the good news. We have a king, a king who loves us, who gave everything for us. And right now, more than anything, he is waiting for us to tell the world about him because there is no greater news than someone who lived a perfect life, who sits at the right hand of God, making sure that his people, he's interceding for them. He's loving us in such a way that nothing could ever take us out of his hands. That's good news. Me not dying and going to hell, that's good news too, but that's just, that's just that much of it. And we wonder why people aren't interested in listening when we knock on the door. Hey, have you heard the good news about Jesus? You need Jesus, otherwise you're going, it's like, wait a second, there's so much more. There is a life full of life and light that's associated with it. So that is my prayer for us, is that we would fall over these next few weeks, fall in love with Jesus again and again and again. So, Father, we, we just come to you humbly asking for your grace and your mercy because we are but dust and we are frail and we forget sometimes just how good you are. We forget the goodness of our Savior and our King Jesus. 
we forget that he's the one who is our king and not ourselves. So, Father, help us, remind us. Let us read scripture anew. Let us read it with understanding some of these words that you don't call him Christ for nothing. He's not called Lord for nothing. That these things are important. And Father, show us. Show us what it means to be living in the kingdom of God. That's what we need, Father. We need your help in doing so. The kingdoms of this earth are filled with ways to distract us. And so, Father, we, we want to be good citizens of your kingdom. And so we ask for your grace and mercy in doing so and your wisdom. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Messiah, our King.